going to record. It's um, recording. Yes. You know, it has that little sign up there, so I don't know how I could miss it, but somehow I can. Um, all right, so with Kant, he said in order to teach children ethics, you just teach them, don't act on your inclinations, don't ask yourself how, what you feel like doing, just think about your duty, right? What can you will to be a universal law? What is the right thing to do apart from any sort of inclination it has nothing to do with um, consequences. So for example, if you decide to, okay, so you don't wanna tell your grandma what you really think of her sort of blue hair that she dyed gray, but it comes out with this blue tinge. You don't like it. She asks you, do you like it, right? Well, I don't wanna make her feel bad. So I'll tell her yes and say, no, you're not treating her like a human being. Human beings are capable of the truth and you should tell them the truth. You shouldn't use language to deliberately um, distort or deny what, what is actually in your head because language is the tool of reason and, and a rational person would never deliberately lie. So, but what if you say, but if I tell her the truth, she's gonna be mad at me or my parents are gonna get mad at me. You know, that's all consequences. You don't think about consequences. You treat your grandma like a rational being capable of accepting what you think is true. Okay, so that's the method, is that you start out teaching kids from a young age um, to always act on what's right. Don't worry about how you feel and don't worry about the consequences. Um, and so this was the day we did the applications. Now, Ivy, did you have a reaction to any of those? Um, so for examples, I was thinking maybe like whether or not to follow your heart or whether or not to um, follow your family, if that makes sense. Okay, what would he say? Uh, he would tell you that what your family thinks is just consequences and it's you, you know, what you believe and what you want to do with your life. But not your heart. <laughs> yeah, it's... I guess, based on the choices and what would be better for you. Okay, so that's, yeah. here's another issue when you're deciding what you wanna do with your life, right? How do you will? I mean, for example, I decided I wanted to get a PhD in philosophy. I would never will every person to, to get a PhD in philosophy, right? Yeah. I can't will that to be universal law. Well, what am I actually willing? I have to re-describe what I'm willing, what I'm actually doing. Are you wanting more like-minded people? <laughs> or, you know, the message, like more people to be knowledge, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it is a little bit tricky figuring out what is the principle governing my behavior right so would a better example be whether or not to help someone that you see is uh needs help or to keep going with your life because you're busy would that be a better example or um well the good samaritan story yeah <laughs> uh, the, the golden rule would be you know how would you want to be treated obviously you should stop by the road help and person yeah um, but the one on deciding what to do, I think the principle the, of your, the maxim or the principle you would be acting on is everybody ought to decide what they're good at it, what they're good at, what they enjoy doing and what the world needs, how they can help other people. And they should act on the best they know, they should choose what the best they know is where those three things meet, right? Okay, so yeah, they should do what's uh, best for them and 
like if they have two different jobs they should pick the job that is more how do you say for their talents okay right, right. that they have to be good at it because you can't will that other people just because they want to do something they'll do something they're not good at right right yes and it has to be something you have to have training your will so that what you get satisfaction from is also something that actually benefits other people. Okay. Right? Because that's yeah. what you want everybody else to do. So something you can do, something that satis satisfies you and helps other people. That's your duty to find out that thing and then choose it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Choose it yes. just because it's the right thing, just because you would, this is what everybody needs to do to have a good society, but everybody needs to be acting on their duty, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's possible that you have this talent like PhD in philosophy, but it's the most difficult degree. It takes the longest, you get shredded, you're on <laughs> for a while. It's just horrible. Um, but that doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> this is like artists. You know, everyone tells you you're just going to be dying and living on the streets. But that doesn't matter. Do it. You know, it's for you. <laughs> well, it's your gift, right? It's anybody in your place who has that talent and knows that art is important. It can help other people. And that's why you want to do it. You absolutely need to do it because that's what you would want everybody else to do when they figure out what they can do, right? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you have to remember to keep your emotions out of it. Yeah. I think uh, Locke said something about that. You have to leave it up to other people because humans, uh, we overreact or we put too much of our emotions into it. Locke is different. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, we'll get there. So, okay. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to Kant. Um, let's see, Ivy, did you have any other comment you wanna make before I ask Warren? Uh, no, I'm good. <laughs> okay, Warren, what, was, what, would, what did you wanna comment on? Um, what I wanted to comment on, it's not necessarily what you guys were talking on. But it had, it's something related to Kant and how his teachings are applied. Um, the, the article that I went across that stood out to me, because from the readings, the thing that stood out to me the most was the article by the New York Times, um, where they spoke about um, the data-driven life. Yes. That did, you read, one, did you read the whole thing? I mean, it's really long. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't read the whole thing, but I read the first few pages and then I skipped down to the end. And I even had some examples from what they said in it. But really, what I said was, in a sense, from the research that they did, in a sense, I would say they were kind of biased because all of the people that they mentioned in the, in the article were all people, were all persons from um, background. They had jobs that had to deal with data. They were all computer persons. So it would be easier for them to transfer all of that um, detailed um, lifestyle over into their personal life to, to where to me, it was biased in a sense. If they went more on a broader scope and had a broader research that had to deal with like people who are not data driven because of their jobs, I would say it would have more of a compelling pull as opposed to them just having people, oh, this person who works in IT and his job requires him to do this. They realize with data, life is easier in a sense, like when they have things um, written down to specifics. But actually there was a study that I came across a few months ago that said, um, cause basically you're talking about people who are organized and the study said people who are not organized, like people who have messy rooms, tend to have higher IQs. 
which would be strange if a lot of people heard it because the reason why they said they tend to have IR IQs is because they have so much things in their room in a mess, but it, their memory knows exactly where to find what in the mess, if that makes sense. So say they have a pile of clothes and they know that, oh, my black shirt is about midway in the pile or my black shirt is in that pile. It kind, it kind of works on their memories to be like, okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, even though it's a mess, I know exactly what's in my mess. So it kind of works your brain harder to recollect that that's where your shirt is as opposed to people who have everything detailed down to the T where they have all their black shirts folded right here, white shirts folded right here, pink shirts folded right here. There's not much of a challenge in that lifestyle as opposed to not saying we should all have messy rooms or anything, but it just goes to show that having everything detailed or having everything data-driven or have everything written down to, to the T is not always the easiest way or it's not the best thing for everyone because not everyone can keep it in that form. Okay, well, the main point here is this was a certain time in history when Kant represented a certain view of reason that everybody wanted everybody to learn so that the culture could move forward. Um, so they believed if we can just train people to think this way, we will be able to make all sorts of progress and people won't be irrational like they are now, right? And they would say the church, you know, fuels their fears and tells them, you know, just think about eternal life. And then they don't act rationally, right? They don't act on data because they keep saying, oh, God will take care of it or blah, blah. So this was at that point in history, this use of reason was going to be our salvation. Um, things have been discovered since then, but my job is to get you to understand that people were on board with this and they had a reason. It made sense at the time. Um, do both of you understand that? Yes. Yeah, when I was reading through um, Locke, I was agreeing with a lot of it, but then I was like, this wouldn't be okay now. It doesn't make sense now, but at the time I can see where this made perfect sense and it was okay. That's great. That's what I want because the, I want to argue that the road to hell is paved with good intentions because then you all have to figure out, well, what is true right now? What are our good intentions that are leading straight to hell? It's and, always about the context of time. It's always about the time period that we're in because I mean, it's certain it, things that they do back then or certain things that were okay back then won't necessarily be okay right now because it's a whole different world well you have to study why so that you can be at the forefront in your own society this is liberal education right somebody's got to lead somebody's got to be able to spot the blindnesses and explain why we need to move in a different direction and it needs to be students who are educated in this history of ideas so that you can look and go oh it what you know so what's the analog now what are we doing now that history in 50 years 100 years is going to look back and say how could they have been so ignorant well it made sense at the time does that make sense you all yes okay yes. so that's in your final paper you know you're going to have to deal with that and also uh remember in this particular class it's what are we thinking is a healthy psyche now? And what are our blindnesses about trying to give everybody a healthy psyche? I think history will say we've got a lot of blindnesses that are going to be exposed. Um, keep that in mind. But all right, so this one was Kant and Rousseau. So just to get the main idea there, is that when science started to come in, the, the uh, scientific revolution and the industrial revolution, 
um, uh, Rousseau was saying, no, no, it's just going to make people better at being corrupt and deceiving themselves. We got to get back to nature. Does everybody, you know, do you know people who say, I want to raise my kid naturally. I want him to be able to run outside and figure out for themselves. What? Yeah. yeah. Does everybody sort of intuitively understand that, that even today we have people like that? And mm-hmm. this is a huge gap, right? Rousseau says we have to stick to nature and Kant says, no, not at all, right? More and more, we have to ignore our inclinations, not act on the basis of pleasure, pain, consequences, and become more and more conscious of our reason and get in that habit of acting on the basis of a good will. He really did think, you know, we can culturally cultivate a collective good will and teach that in the educational system and that will be our salvation right whereas rousseau no no we got to get back to nature and we have to have kids connected and that will be our salvation so education and the education of children became this huge issue at that time uh because it was the root you know it was that what kind of adults do you want? You have to start in childhood. And there were these just huge disagreements about what the scientific revolution means and how we should use science, math, applications to create a culture. Here, this is a huge controversy. Um, So I would say, uh, Warren, just FYI, in my house, I have a lot of art on the wall, but it every piece reminds me of like the friends I saw in Greece, my whole history in Indonesia, my children and my whole history with my children. Um, there's a spider and that reminds me of uh, the goddess of a uh, spider goddess who weaves a web because I always thought of myself as weaving the web of the extended family and I could go on and on but it's not just memory Warren it's just this whole history and all these stories and all these weaving all this stuff together so I always have things on the wall that'll trigger all that because that's what I think I'm doing um and that is and I stayed at a house near my daughter so I could go visit my daughter in DC and their house was like, would have been, was worth, you know, a million, couple million bucks in DC. It's extremely beautiful. It's mm-hmm. an older house. It's all fixed up, but it has nothing. It's so sterile. Like everything. It's empty. Yes. Yeah, it's empty and it's all geometric lines, you know, very rigid lines. And then there's, they have kids and they have like three pictures, like one of their wedding and a couple of the kids and that's it. Oh, my house is just all full of pictures of my kids and when they're all different ages. And I do think it affects your brain, obviously. It really, it's really profound and nobody, I mean, I'd like to be an interior decorator, right? Tell people, ask them, what is meaningful to you? what people in your life are meaningful to you, you know? I mean, it, it is crazy, but it's related to this. This is exactly what it's related to. Is this is that thing? like similar to um, the difference between like the medieval castles and the bear code castles? Or am I pronouncing that right? Uh, <laughs> but in the medieval castles, they had like really small uh, cold and it was like horrible castles that you wouldn't think that they would have and then now uh the bear co is like lavish paintings everywhere all decorative and like those were people that they say that's the um what is it italian italian room oh my god italian yeah. renaissance and yeah. all intelligence and all that but medieval times they were barbaric you know yeah actually the vatican is located right when where the renaissance took place and so you've all got all these uh, sexually repressed priests, and then all around there is all this 
you know, uh, sensuous paintings of Mary. <laughs> I mean, because they're, no, no, humanity is great. So you've got these very voluptuous Mary. <laughs> anyway, that's, a, that's another story. But I guess with the cathedrals, uh, this is another example, but you can do this with your house too, is um, the cathedral is, is a uh, light and sound emotion. Uh, it's the whole, a whole appeal to all five senses to get you into a worldview, a spiritual worldview. So it's noisy and dirty and all that. You step into this cathedral and it's a rocket ship to heaven, right? So all the engineers, the best engineers figured out how to make these incredibly narrow, high buildings. I mean, it's incredible engineering for that. This is obviously where they focused all their talent. And then the light from the windows comes from up there down, right? Okay, we got it. And then the music is very mystical and very quiet, the opposite of this world. And then there's the rosary that you touch and the incense that you inhale. So, I mean, it's designed to appeal to your physical brain, but to get it to think about non-physical things. And so uh, we, now we've gotten off, but it, it's, it is related because in the enlightenment, it's a blank slate and we are going to restructure the human psyche. So you do exactly the opposite. You start out with nothing. And so if you go into a Presbyterian church, there's no art because Calvin is against that. That's sensuous. And so it's supposed to be just the sermon. Just use your reason, just theology. And you're supposed to repress your desires. And that's, you know, consistent with Kant. And Kant was a deist. Calvin is Presbyte is a uh, Protestant, right? So Kant does reject Catholicism. He has his own path to God. And that path is going to include um, no art, right? So his the neuro thugs thing is uh, Kant really trivialized art. And what he did was, uh, I hope this makes sense to you. He didn't want any yes. stories of heroes. He didn't want, you know, all that Greek crap about the heroes and all this stuff because it's so emotional, like cut it out. We aren't going to have those emotions anymore. He truly said that. Instead, you, you know, art is your leisure time activity at the end of the day. And you go and look at uh, doilies, you know, green, just wallpaper with little green uh, designs on it. So it's just the notion of design, but abstract design. So you get to like the primary colors and the primary shapes, and that drives you into this part of your brain that's everybody, you know, is the same and it's abstract. It's not about people, but it takes your emotion, it just, you know, taps your sensitivity to color and shape and design and that's it right that's art and and so it got really really trivialized um does that make sense to you guys yes <laughs> sorry um if you like art i'm going to teach philosophy of art in the spring ivy and we just talk about that that art was yeah i was thinking about that class when you mentioned it I think you'd like it because how, I mean, it's, it's really important. I was just thinking about that today because this whole critical race theory, we need history. We need African-American history. We need African-American art. And that, the history is a kind of art because you pick what it is you're gonna say and you organize it in a certain way. It has a mind behind it. Let's just admit that anyway. Yeah, so he trivialized art, the data-driven life, um, and that was supposed to be act on the principle, you know? And I used to, I had what I would call an eating disorder. Starting in seventh grade, I counted calories. 
So I just eat calories. I don't eat food. I don't enjoy food very much. I don't. I That's think a disorder? Of, well, I mean, you don't enjoy food. You just eat calories, right? I mean. Oh, so you only eat like 2,000 calories. That's it? I know how many calories were in everything I ate. Oh my goodness. That's well, a talent, I mean, right? What? That's kind of a talent. <laughs> it's a data-driven life, right? <laughs> but I would say it's not healthy. Does that make sense? Yes. I, yeah. I can understand where it wouldn't, you know. To but it's very, con- it's very Kantian. Data-driven life, right? Yeah, it reminds me of uh, where was it last class you were talking about how the parents um, raised the children with no emotion. So you just ate calories, uh, not you ate food for the substance, not necessarily the flavor and enjoyment. Right. No, uh, Aristotle, not too much, not too little, you know, the right thing. And you enjoy that, right? You enjoy the company. You enjoy eating in moderation. You know, yeah. my ex-husband was like that. I'm like, oh, nobody's <laughs> like that. <laughs> but but it was nice. I kept, you know, having the kids kind of, I was hoping my children would sort of absorb that attitude and not notice that I'm <laughs> over here, you know. Uh, but anyway, all right. So then the next point was the German child rearing practices. Um, this is what happens when something gets taken to an extreme. Um, I don't know if you read this, but I would recommend it. Um, she's asking, you know, who orchestrated the, the Holocaust and how could they be so heartless, right? Like, where is this coming from? And so she went and studied the child rearing practices um, of Germany at the time. And Heinrich Himmler, he was raised this way. His dad, when he turns 11, his dad tells him childhood is over. And now he has to, uh, he has to keep a journal of every single thing he does. Um, Swim, let's see, the 22nd of July, uh, his father says, first swim, you know, and then uh, you know, he's he's not supposed to have any emotions, right? He's just supposed to keep track of his behavior. Um, and then he says, it must, oh, and then he, he's talking about this picture of the family. They have this huge mask, you know, like nobody's smiling, nothing. It said, uh, the child, German child rearing experts from this and the last century, this is the advice they give. Crush the will, establish dominance, permit no disobedience, suppress everything in the child. I have seen illustrations from the books of one of these experts, uh, Dr. Um, Schreber, At first glance, these pictures recall images of torture. They're pictures of children whose posture or behavior is being corrected. A brace up the spine, a belt tied to a waist, and the hair at the back of the neck so the child will not slump. A metal plate at the edge of a desk to keep the child from curling over. A child tied to a bed to prevent poor sleeping posture or masturbation. Um, uh, okay. And then let's see. And then another thing. Oh yeah. This same expert, she's talking about your inner life and your outer life. And they're trying to control somebody's inner life. Right. Um, let's see. And the one other thing is this Schreiber, this expert, um, it didn't seem to occur to anybody. Yes. Um, the child, Schreiber said, should be permeated by the impossibility of locking something in his heart. The doctor who gave this advice had a son who was hospitalized for disabling schizophrenia. Another of his children committed suicide, but this was not taken as a warning against his approach. Okay. All right, you guys. 
Now, the average Kantian would be outraged, like this is not what Kant meant, blah, blah, blah. But it is what he said, right? Does everybody mm -hmm. understand that? Yes. If you take it seriously, why isn't that what Kant said? All right. Anyway, and so he, these were, I didn't give you the articles to read, but on the one hand, he's in favor of critical thinking. He wants a citizenship that, okay, when you're, if you're in military, when you're at work, you obey, but outside of work, you can criticize, is this a good war? You're supposed to be able to deliberate publicly. And this is the Greeks had this too, and he knows that. Um, you pay your taxes, but you speak out about the corruption and the priorities. If you're a minister, you serve your parishioners, you explain what the denomination teaches, but you let them think for themselves, right? Give them opportunities to question. As a monarch, you care for their welfare, you make sure you're, you're doing what you can to help them flourish, but don't hide behind religion and allow them to use their own reason in matters of conscience. Don't try to control. Okay, so um, the goal is to maximize the use of your mind. Then this one was about the duties of a law-abiding citizen, the way Mr. Um, Eichmann um, said, the principle of my will always has to be such that it can become the principle of general laws. That's Kant, right? That's fair. But when he was charged with carrying out the final solution, he changed it. He distorted Kant. The categorical imperative of the Third Reich. Act so as the principle of your actions is the same as the legislator or the law of the land. So now you act in the way that the, you think the Fuhrer, Hitler, if he knew your action, he would approve it. And he called it, he knows what he's doing. He called it the version of Kant for the household use of the little man, right? Um, it rules out, obedience. Uh, let's see. Uh, the similarities between Kant and Eichmann is a law is a law, no exceptions. Um, Eichmann himself made an exception because he had these Jewish friends and he felt guilty about it, that he didn't send them to the, the gas chambers because you're supposed to be, you know, absolute. Um, then he completely changed all of a sudden. Uh, his absolutes went in the opposite direction and uh, Eichmann broke down. I mean, these guys went crazy toward the end because their, their brains, you know, their heart and their head just couldn't. Um, so then she asked, what is the nature of human judgment? Um, is this the goal? Are we born with an instinctual moral sense or do we have to just act totally on our reason? Um, are people responsible as individuals? Is there collective guilt? Um, then there's another article about uh, that one, you don't have to think about that. Kant's mythology, he was very racist. Jefferson was racist. Hegel, all these Enlightenment thinkers were racist. Um, if you want these articles, I can try to find them for you. Then the care of the soul, it talks about people are out of touch with their bodies. They treat their bodies like a machine. And that this guy thinks there's something wrong with that, right? You should you should be more like the Renaissance. You should be in touch with your body. Um, okay, and then, all right, so here we are. We have like 10 minutes left and we're getting to Locke. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the general overall view of Locke and we have two more days, but Locke, the narrative tells you his background. Um, the letter he, let's see, let me, let me go to the Declaration of Independence, okay? I mean, here's the whole declaration there, so you can read it. And here's my summary of it to show you the comparison between what Locke, Locke 
has a book called The Second Treatise on Government. And chapter 20 is about dissolving a government. And it says, if you have a leader who is a tyrant, you have to prove that the leader is not ruling for the sake of the ruled, that the leader is using his power to centralize his own power. The leader has no right, no natural right to do that. And if that's true, human beings have a natural right to use their reason and to rebel against that leader. So, um, so anyway, he, Locke starts this way. What is the natural state of, of nature? What is the condition we're all in? It's a state of perfect freedom to order your actions as we think fit within the bounds of the law of nature, right? I mean, you can't defy gravity. Uh, but anyway, it's a state of equality. So in the state of nature, we are all born perfectly free and perfectly equal. And we're all children of God. Okay. Because we're by nature free, equal, and independent, no one can be put out of this condition and subjected to political power without his own consent. You have to agree to it, right? Now, what would a rational person agree to? Well, if you're rational, you will agree to give up certain rights as long as there are a set of laws um, established by elected officials and officials who want to protect everybody's rights and they have to be equal. So you're willing to give up some of your freedom as long as those laws make your life easier and are applied equally to everyone. They were, cre they were created by elected officials and they are enforced by elected officials or appointed officials that always rule for the benefit of the ruled, that always pr uh, protect the rights of everybody equally. Um, it's the good of the people is the only goal. And the good of the people is the protection of their rights. Okay, you can't raise taxes without their consent, which if you elected certain officials and the officials uh, vote to have a certain tax structure, that's called tacit consent. Uh, you consent tacitly because you consent to live under the rule of law, and you elected the officials that decided that policy or that law. Okay, you, the legislature can't transfer the power of making laws to anybody else. His definition of tyranny is the exercise of power beyond their right. The leaders have no right to abuse their power. When it, wherever law ends, tyranny begins. Uh, if the law, if the reason you're violating the laws is to harm other people, whoever exceeds the power given to him by law and makes use of the force he has uh, to enforce upon subjects that which the law doesn't allow, he's no longer a legitimate official. He acts without authority and he can be opposed. Uh, by any other person who by force invades the right. In other words, rulers have no right to abuse their power and the citizens have a right to overthrow them. Whenever the legislators destroy the property of the people, reduce them to slavery, put them into a state of war with the people, um, put themselves into a state of war with the people, they forfeit the respect of the people, right? They have no right and the power goes to the people. It reverts to the community. Um, okay, let's see for this. Okay, um, 
concerning the Supreme Executive. Uh, okay, and then the last one, but what about the claim? People will say, if you say people have a right to rebel, they're just gonna keep rebelling all the time. You know, We're not gonna have a stable government uh, if, if people can set up a new legislature whenever they want. And Locke says, my answer to that is people really live by custom and they don't rebel very often. But if there's a long train of abuses, lies, tricks, all tending the same way, and it's visible to the people, then they have an obligation to fight back. Who shall be the judge? The people shall be the, the judge. The power that every individual gave the society when he agreed to enter and live under the rule of law, it never revert, re, reverts back to individuals, get it, but it can revert back to the community. And the people have a right to act as the supreme legislative to erect a new form or under the old form, put it in new hands as they think good. All right, now, what does our Declaration of Independence say? When, okay, here's how, okay, Locke says, here's how the people in charge get corrupted. They introduce new laws. They, the prince hinders the legislative from assembling in due time. So the, lead, the prince prevents the lawmakers from assembling. Um, uh, they're altered, the prince, the prince changes the way it's structured without their consent. Um, they deliver people into this, the hands of a foreign power. Okay, here's a whole list. Then you go to our Declaration of Independence. And what does our declaration say? Well, it says, this is what the king did, right? He's called together, he's refused to pass laws for the accommodation. Okay, he's refused to assent to the laws that were created for the public good. He's forbidden his governors to pass the laws. He's meddling with the system. He's refused to pass other laws for the accommodations of large districts for the well being of the people. He's called together the bodies at, at uncomfortable times. He's, you know, he's making it hard for people to meet and give themselves the laws and applies the laws. He's dissolved the representative house repeatedly, right? He's, He's at war against um, our elected official. He's refused to, to um, allow other people to be elected. So he's messing with the legislative branch of government. Um, he's obstructed the administrative, right? The judicial system, he's messing with that. He's made the judges uh, depend upon his will instead of the judges are supposed to be acting on the laws. So that's tyranny. Um, he's made all these new offices. Let's see, let's see. Um, there was another one where he messed with the military, obviously. Um, that's why we had that second amendment. The only, the reason people could have guns was if the people collectively, this, if the prince, the authoritarian leader, tries to get the national military to declare a war on the people, that's why people have guns, is to fight back against the British military, right? It wasn't, it was not you know, that you can go to a gun shop and buy whatever gun you want. It was not about that. Um, okay, um, he's imposed taxes. He's, oh, there's one more where he subjected us to, the, to this foreign power, which is the Native Americans. So they use the Native Americans, you know, to score another point. But my main point here is that a um, couple points that I want you to get. Okay, Locke has a whole worldview, a right. We have natural rights, right to life, liberty, health, possessions, right to um, 
if somebody hurts us, we have a right to fight back. But people tend to judge poorly in their own case. So somebody hurts somebody, somebody overreacts, then those people overreact. So if you're rational and you're calculating the best means to your own preservation of your life, liberty, health, and possessions, you will agree to give over that right to a standing body of laws. But if there's a prince or somebody else who starts messing with the legal system, they don't let the legislators make laws. They don't let the judges administer the laws, right? They, then they take the enforcement mechanism like the police and the military and sick them against the people, right? All of that stuff is there for. And so our declaration is using the method, scientific method you can, to teach people to critique their government based on facts and data. And with the, the standard there is that the purpose of government is to protect you as you go about um, being free and equal and figuring out how to flourish. So originally, Locke, the purpose of laws was simply military and police security, protecting your uh, you're protecting yourself from harm. That's the right that you gave over, the right to fight back, right? But today, what does that mean today? Well, no environmental laws at all. Because at that time, there was no problem. Just cut down trees and grow plants. And that's how we became rich, by letting people do whatever they wanted with our land. We don't live in an agricultural world anymore. We, even industrial, we live in a high tech world. What does that mean? We have exploited natural resources to the point where we're killing ourselves and we still cling to this minimal government. Anyway, so first of all, our founders were absolutely lock. They had the mindset, no qualms about it. You take this, you take Jefferson to the dean's office if, if he were a, a college student at this point. It's a total cheat sheet. Um, and then it has all this profound impact on our legal system and the mindset of how you think about marriage, how you think about children, how you think about economics. So that's what we want to get to for next time. Um, and so I have to let you go. But do you have any questions or comments? No, not right now. I'm here still. Do you understand the power of the mindset? Almost exactly do. I'm actually, um, there's a psychology class that I'm taking right now that we're going over self-efficacy. Okay. But yeah, I mean, the thing, think about how many times Americans talk about rights, right? Mm -hmm. And that that, it gets... I mean, it'd be interesting for you to figure out how are these things coordinated, right? Is there, yes, a political, yes. yeah, is there a political agenda behind all that without people even realizing maybe they're being brainwashed or not, you know? Probably. I mean, self-efficacy, except that if you're Black, you can't buy a house in a neighborhood where your house will can't create any value, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean... Okay, it's complicated, but I I enjoy, I hope students understand you've got to start putting it together. You're just not gonna, not gonna get it. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Okay, good. That's exciting. I'm glad. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.